Hello guys and welcome to lecture 2 covering nutrition and metabolism. This lecture is going to cover the fat soluble vitamins, water soluble vitamins, minerals and trace elements. Now on your exam for AMP1 or AMP2 your vitamin, minerals and trace elements is a pretty big question. And basically what you're going to get back is a list of fat soluble vitamins, water soluble vitamins, minerals and trace elements. They'll be all mixed in together and there will be two blanks beside the question. You're going to have to identify the vitamin, mineral, or trace element as FS for fat soluble, WS for water soluble, M for mineral, or TE for trace element. And then you're going to have to provide a single function for that vitamin, mineral, or trace element. Now all of your functions are listed right here in bold and underlined. Uh, you can use these functions for any of these vitamins, minerals, and trace elements we cover. You can also get other functions from your book, your nutrition text, the almighty Google. Wherever you find a good function, it works. So I'll cover some of my favorites, some that stick in my head the best, but just a single function is all you'll actually need to have memorized on the test. Now multiple choice will cover functions as well, and multiple choice will cover deficiencies. So pay attention to deficiencies in the multiple choice questioning. Excesses I pretty much leave off. But deficiencies, you'll see several questions that may say something like night blindness is a deficiency in which vitamin? And it's got, you know, A, B, C, or D. Well, vitamin A will be one of those choices. So to begin with, our fat-soluble vitamins, you can remember them by DECA, D-E-K-A, DECA. So vitamin D, vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin K. Vitamin A, probably my most favorite or easiest to remember is visual pigments. Uh, beta carotenes needed for vision. When I was a kid and my mom always told me if I ate a lot of carrots I could see in the dark, which never really happened, but I guess it got me to eat my carrots. Bone and tooth formation will work. Epithelial cells, a lot of your lotions and things will have you know, vitamin A in them. So there's a lot of other functions for this vitamin. Um, it's also a pretty famous antioxidant. So you can do more than what's just here, but any of these would work. Deficiencies you see down here, so I won't spend time reading them to you since you can see them. Vitamin D, obviously most people go with this choice for your bone and teeth formation. Now on a test, when you put a, a function, one word answers don't work. You just can't, you know, on most of them, you can't put bones. Well, now tell me what is it for, for bones, or that it's for visual pigments, or something like that. So try to stay away from too short of an answer and use a few words to explain it. It also shows you where it can normally be found, where it's stored, but we're paying attention mostly to functions and deficiencies. For our next ones, vitamin E and K, stability of cell membranes, easiest to remember. I think on my end, because vitamin E is so heavily used in lotions, you can buy vitamin E oil to help prevent stretch marks. Most of all these, you know, stretch mark preventer lotions and oils will have lots of vitamin E in them. So it helps the cell membranes, which what all cells are made out of, and it's good for your skin. It prevents the breakdown or oxidation of A. Vitamin K, very narrow function. Necessary for prothrombin synthesis. Now this is one of the crucial proteins in the cycle that leads to blood clotting. Matter of fact, when you have a newborn baby, uh, the, one of the very first injections they get is vitamin K. And vitamin K is there to help clot the blood in case there's any need for that. Prothrombin synthesis, think blood clotting, you'll remember vitamin K. And D-E-K-A, DECA, that's easy to remember which ones are fat soluble. Our water soluble vitamins will be coming up next. If you look at this slide, you've got sources where you can find vitamin K, A, E. And you see fruits and veggies are on here a lot. Vitamin D is more of something that's, you know, fish liver oils, which are very healthy for you with other pretty famous, the omega-3 fatty acids. Skin, you know, so eating skin off something like a piece of chicken or something like that. Multiple choice will cover some of this. No, don't don't try and memorize everything where you would find them. Just as long as you got a good general knowledge, you're okay. And usually you can pick vegetables and fruit and be correct anyway. Water soluble vitamins tie back to cell respiration, glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the ETC. Vitamin B2, also called riboflavin, so know it both ways. Part of enzymes and coenzyme FAD. Now this molecule is one of the molecules that is 
vital during the Krebs cycle. FAD plus gets converted into FADH2. It's an electron carrier. Donates electrons to the electron transport chain. So we'll write out cell respiration on the board in class and, and you'll mark like vitamin B2 beside FAD. So you can tie that one with this. Vitamin B1, you can use carbohydrate oxidation or help peruvic acid enter the TCA cycle. Now peruvic acid is also known as peruvate and the tricarboxylic acid cycle is also known as the Krebs cycle, which is normally what I call it. There's actually three names, the citric acid cycle, the TCA cycle, and the Krebs cycle. Once again, pay attention to deficiencies for multiple choice purposes, but definitely have one of these for a function with these B vitamins in case they're on your exam. And know them by both thymine and B1, riboflavin and B2. Next slide, pantothenic acid or B5. Part of coenzyme A. Coenzyme A is one of the start molecules in the Krebs cycle. The very first reaction of the Krebs cycle, it's not something that anatomy and physiology students have to memorize, but the very first reaction, a molecule of acetyl coenzyme A combines with a molecule called oxaloacetate to make citrate. That's the first product of the Krebs cycle. That's why it's sometimes called the citric acid cycle, because that's the first thing made. So this is involved in the reactions of the Krebs cycle, which produce your majority of electron carriers that are going to donate electrons to the electron transport chain, the last step of cell respiration. That is where most of the ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is made from the breakdown of glucose, let's say. Once again, deficiencies for multiple choice. Niacin, NAD, this is the biggest electron carrier you have. Uh, you make uh, 10 NADH molecules during glycolysis and the Krebs cycle that will donate electrons and drive, drive that formation of ATP in the electron transport chain. So having a lot of niacin in something tends to increase energy. If you go and you look at, say, Monster Energy Drink or the 5-hour energy shots, they're going to have a ton of niacin. I think 5-hour energy shots have like 8,000% of the recommended daily allowance. So it's just a big shot of niacin. And if you got B vitamins, you've got energy. Because you notice they're all working with things that are involved in you know, cellular respiration, the Krebs cycle. Once again, deficiencies, multiple choice. Vitamin B12 and B6 are very broad. You know, you got some pretty big things here needed for nucleic acid synthesis, making a DNA, RNA, myelin sheath formation. That's the fat that wraps around your nerves. Uh, swan cells produce it. Um, unmyelinated nerves, uh, typically the signal doesn't travel well. So you have diseases like MS where you lose myelin and that's what causes all the, the effects of that disease. Red blood cell formation. So vitamin B12 is needed to make red blood cells and important in the red bone marrow of your bones. B6, I just put coenzymes needed for the synthesis of proteins because it's involved in so many reactions all across your body that involve making proteins. We just leave it at that. So that's a very broad function. Now, if you want to get out there on the internet and, and get a more narrowed down function or pull from a nutrition text, that is perfectly fine. You do not have to repeat the functions I've listed on these notes. There are many more you could name, and I'll grade correct answers. So if you find something, it'll make sure it's correct before you write it down. But if you want to use something besides this for a function for B6, that is perfectly fine. And then deficiencies again. We go to biotin and folic acid, coenzyme required for metabolism of amino acids, fatty acids, and nucleic acids. So involved in the breakdown and build up of some of these molecules, that's a pretty broad function there for biotin as well. Pretty heavy in mushrooms, one of my personally favorite foods. Mushrooms, very good for you. Deficiencies, you know, you can lead to elevated blood cholesterol levels because of your fatty acids metabolism here. Folic acid, you might find a function out there for it that's heart health because of needed for normal red blood cell production. Usually if you go to Walmart and you buy one of those heart healthy vitamins, it's going to have a large amount of folic acid in it. So if you want to go get something more specific on this as well, you know, feel free. But either one of these will work for a function. And now remember, 
on the test, you're going to have to, when you see this word, you're going to have to label this. WS for water soluble, and then put needed for normal red blood cell production or function. Or something that you've learned independently from your book or online. Vitamin C, I usually will accept it if you put immune health. Um, because vitamin C is advertised so famously for boosting the immune system. Uh, there's pretty good studies that back that up, though there's nothing set in stone that if you take your vitamin C, you're going to avoid the flu all season. But it definitely doesn't hurt to get a good amount of vitamin C. Um, vitamin C is a big antioxidant as well, so taking pretty good amounts of it is something that a lot of people recommend. So you can buy vitamin C tablets, vitamin C gum, vitamin C gummy bears. You can go get that airborne stuff that uh, some teacher made. It's basically a lot of vitamin C mixed in with a few herbs that are supposedly, you know, do the same thing in boosting immunity like echinacea. But if you want to use something more specific like promoting the absorption of iron, synthesis of hormones from cholesterol, collagen production, you can use any of these as well. Pick and choose there for vitamin C. A lot of functions you could list for that, as well as antioxidant properties. You can list that for vitamin A, vitamin C, any of your antioxidants as well. Deficiencies. Scurvy. It was an old deficiency. Pretty common on ships, the pirates, you know, you'd hear about them getting scurvy. If you've ever watched SpongeBob, you've probably heard that term before as well. It was a vitamin, D, vitamin C deficiency, and when they started putting, you know, fruits and things on the ships, that pretty much solved the problem there, especially oranges, which are very high in vitamin C. Minerals, trace elements. Now, this is where people mess up on the test typically. Calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sodium, chlorine. You know, these are all ions, charged particles. They're all major minerals in our body. Calcium's plus two. Um, magnesium's a plus two. Chlorine's negative one. Trace elements you need smaller amounts of just to trace. Iron, copper, iodine, some pretty famous ones. Fluorine, like sodium fluoride in your toothpaste. If I see a mess up on the test, usually it's right here. You know, people want to label iron a mineral, or copper a mineral, or calcium a trace element. So watch your list here and make sure when you label them that when you see sulfur, you know it's an M, a mineral. And when you see zinc, you know it's a TE, trace element. Major functions, calcium has a ton. Um, bone structure is probably the one that most people are familiar with from all the commercials. Um, but my personal favorites are in muscle contraction. If you had me in AMP1, we covered muscle contraction in detail. There's also a video online about muscle contraction you can watch. And calcium is involved in neurotransmitter release and this is the main mineral controlling muscle contraction. Matter of fact, if calcium is present, the muscle is contracting. It's when calcium is not present that it's relaxed. So, pretty easy to remember these two if you watch that muscle contraction video. You can tie that back. And once again, pay attention to deficiencies. Phosphorus, easiest one, personally for me. Adenosine, try what? Phosphate. So phosphorus is involved in so many reactions, major energy reactions of our body. This is gasoline for life. This molecule is what spins the bacterial flagellum so it can move around. It's what opens and closes your transport proteins in many cases. It's basically the chemical energy of life made by our tiny little mitochondria, an ancient endosymbiotic bacteria. So part of ATP, also this one's pretty easy to remember, the backbone of DNA goes sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, and you have a nu nucleotide or a nucleic acid, one of your uh, A, C's, T's, or G's attached to that sugar. So a nucleotide is a deoxyribose sugar attached to, say, an adenine and a phosphate group. But if you look at just the backbone of DNA, sugar, then phosphorus, sugar, then phosphorus, sugar, then phosphorus. So it actually makes up ATP and DNA. Any of these other functions work, feel free to pick and choose. Once again, pay attention to deficiencies. Potassium and sodium, I would tie sodium and potassium together, mainly because of the sodium-potassium pumps, and they're involved in nerve impulse conduction. That's what is the electrical component of your nerves. So the nerve, nervous tissue, we say, is electrochemical communication. Sodium and potassium is the electrical part of this. So pretty easy to remember them at the same time. But if you want to use osmotic pressure, you know, balancing out fluid balance in your body or pH, 
that is perfectly fine as well. You know that throwing off your potassium and sodium levels can change the water content of your body pretty rapidly. Sulfur, component of amino acids. So you find a lot of sulfur in your hair and your skin because hair is pretty much all protein, protein called keratin. So it, it's a structural molecule in many, many amino acids. Sodium here, once again, you can double up sodium and potassium. Use the same answer for both of them. That's an advantage there. Chlorine, probably the easiest for me to remember is this one. Hydrochloric acid, HCl for chlorine. So this is in the stomach. It reacts with pepsinogen to form pepsin, an active enzyme that digests proteins. So it helps start the digestion of proteins uh, in your stomach. Most all digestion actually occurs in your duodenum. Osmotic pressure, once again, this is fluid balances. On a side note, it's a defective chlorine channel that actually causes cystic fibrosis. So if you can't control this molecule as far as its location inside and outside a cell with your little proteins, then that's the whole disease of cystic fibrosis, which is a pretty bad disorder. Magnesium, um, heavily involved in ATP. I'll put that on the board as well. Um, adenosine triphosphate made in the cell respiration and magnesium's heavily involved with those enzymes that run glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. So the production of ATP helps break ATP down into ADP. You'll see magnesium involved there, protein synthesis, making a protein. So any of those functions work as well. Once again, deficiencies for multiple choice. Trace elements. Iron, probably the easiest to remember there is it's a component that is part of hemoglobin. And now you can use others, but this is the biggest thing iron does in your body. For copper, you can say it's needed for hemoglobin synthesis. Don't say it's part of it, just for the synthesis of it. Or bone development, always remember this one. Melanin production for this trace element. Copper skin tone, melanin's our number one uh, controller of the color of our skin. Manganese occurs in enzymes required for fatty acid and cholesterol synthesis. So the enzymes that actually convert. So this is used uh, by your liver a lot. Manganese is something that's used by your liver. Urea formation also occurring in the liver. So this is a liver health trace element. Iodine functioning thyroid. If we want to look at thyroid function, they'll put in a radioactive version of iodine to trace thyroid function. Cobalt required for the synthesis of just several enzymes throughout the body. Pretty general there. Uh, you, that's kind of a cop-out, but if you want to look up something different about cobalt, that's perfectly fine as well. If you want to get into the actual details of which enzymes. Component of tooth structure for fluorine. That's easy to remember. Sodium fluoride. And then zinc. Probably the easiest is wound healing here. Uh, a lot of times they'll put zinc or give you zinc if you've got bed sores or something like that where they're trying to heal up a wound. Uh, bacitration zinc ointment, pretty common to put on wounds to help them heal faster. So very good for your skin, very good in wound healing for zinc. If you take a look at these major minerals up here, trace elements down here, instead of say minor, just say trace elements, you can see where their sources are, some major bodily functions. Any of these functions will work fine as well. Deficiencies, once again, can pay attention to those as far as multiple choice only. But if you see a function in here that you like better than one of the ones I had listed, that's perfectly fine too. And once again, you can Google all of this stuff, find your own functions. But make sure that when you see it on a test, you label zinc as a trace element, iodine as a trace element, and then put a full function. Don't just put thyroid, you know, one word answer. Well, that don't tell me anything. Or put, you know, something that's very short. Uh, wound healing or something like that would actually work. Be careful with what you choose there. That will end lecture two.